uh, just to get us started here this morning, uh, uh, you know, the Fully Alive series has been, uh, uh, been really wonderful, and, and uh, Justin brought this to us with his compatriots uh, up at the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. And it's based on the idea that the wholeness of our lives uh, it, to the glory of God is the purpose of our lives, and that uh, it does not, uh, it is not alone based on uh, the quality, so our perceived quality of our spiritual lives. And as we move through this, uh, and as we're going to continue to move through the different aspects of our life, uh, this is the part of the time we set aside for that which we might call our spiritual lives. And uh, when Bishop Griswold was here last week, uh, his topic was, uh, on Sunday morning, the stated topic was the act of life uh, and the contemplative life. And I just thought I would say a word about what that is, and then I'm going to kind of shift the way I, I hope we'll have a communal conversation about it. So, uh, you know, uh, starting uh, uh, early on in the church and then really uh, in the 14 and 1500s, the, the church uh, really settled in to try to understand the quality and character of the different lives that we lead toward God. And out of that, it came an understanding of a thing that is, became known as the active life and a thing that became known as the contemplative life. Uh, at the time here, when this, uh, the, the power of this rising up, it, it became formed uh, in, in the Roman Catholic Church as uh, people in the active life were, were uh, uh, normal people, right? Like, like all of us, lay people and clergy who had active lives. And, and certain clergy and nuns who took care of uh, parishes and hospitals. And then over here, they uh, had something known as the contemplative life, uh, which was for those uh, who uh, felt called to uh, a more cloistered life uh, in, a, in a convent or in a monastery. And uh, the Orthodox, remember the, the, in 1054 the church split, the Orthodox uh, community has always understood this differently, that these weren't two different types of, two different paradigms of life, the active and the contemplative life were, were what we mixed. Because just to show you my holiness, I mean, I always walk around with an icon in my pocket here, right? Oh. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Do you guys have an icon this in guy. your pocket? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's hard to believe that I even work with these people because they don't have their pocket icon. Um, but this is an icon I got last uh, in the Holy Land up at the Mary Magdalene Church. And it's an icon of Mary and Martha. And so in the active and the contemplative life, this is the story of Mary and Martha, and uh, Mary and Martha Bethany. Uh, some of you who actually came to church over the summer, uh, I, I think I did a, that was a little joke, thank you. Uh, I, I preached a sermon called Pole Dancing with Mary and Martha, uh, and the, the pole dancing was we move between the poles of active and the pole of contemplative, and we move, like, like when you ride a bike, we move uh, to stay in balance there. So uh, I'm going to just finish just a kind of theological introduction. And then uh, the, the other thing is that as the church looked at uh, the, the spiritual theology, the mystical theology of what was happening in people's lives and tried to understand, they also chunked out certain ways to understand these lives. And one was, you know, the, people have an awakening, a, a sense of, a sense of, uh, of, of, a, of, of the divine, and that, that begins to reorient their lives. And the second stage was known as purgation, which is the, the process of moving your life toward an orientation toward God. Uh, and this was all bits and pieces and part of what is known as uh, ascetical theology, how one does this, how one develops spiritual disciplines. And, and then the, the third stage known as illumination is a time when that, that which we, the effort we put into is met with, met with divine response in, in a way that we can palpably understand it. It's also known as indirect uh, contemplation. And, and it's, a, it's a kind of mix of it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mixed life, a kind of like a marble cake. Uh, and then the fourth stage, and again, the, no life is lived in these stages. Uh, it's all much muddier than that. It's known as the dark night of the soul, which is the experience of the deprivation of God, the complete deprivation, the loss of, the loss of all sense of divinity, uh, the reality of God. And then the fifth is known as the unitive or union stage, and that's where people, certain souls, and not, not all that many, uh, uh, experience the, the presence of God without ceasing, and whether or not uh, that was like um, the, the sense of the divinity, the divine, divine presence is just there like rain on a garden, or uh, it's just, just part of your life. And uh, but 
what I, I, I just frame all that, but what I really want to talk about today is uh, this great thing that I uh, have been reading about, which is gene our genetics. We're 99% we're, we're the same genetically, and, and we're, we're fussing more often than not over the 1% difference. I'd like to talk about the 99% the sameness of things, which is to say that in our spiritual lives, we 99% of the time all experience the same thing and are trying to make sense out of what is that, or lack of what is that. And uh, I know last week when, when Bishop Griswold was here and he shared his life uh, and some of the, his experience of the Spirit, you get a sense of a man who has uh, a lifelong uh, spiritual discipline that he has dedicated countless hours to, and yet uh, the result of that is that is, is a more beautiful and transparent humanity and a humility that, that uh, doesn't draw, doesn't seek to draw attention to, to uh, a kind of pridefulness, uh, you know, a pridefulness in, in, in um, accompl spiritual accomplishment or anything like that, but just a, a great sense of communion. And, and, and out of that uh, communion in the human family and the power of the spirit, I thought we'd have a conversation today where you all provide the content, because we're tired. Uh, <laughs> No, we really can respond uh, to what your questions might be so that, uh, so that, you know, when we get all done here in the next uh, little bit, we can feel that, that we've had the kind of witness and bonding of our lives that grow out of, grow out of the depths of, you know, the depths of our relationships. Yeah, Lisa. Um, since you began your faith journey, Yeah, so the question, you know, uh, thank you for the easy question to get things started. Uh, uh, you know, since our, our faith journeys, uh, if I might uh, try not to bastardize what you said, what has, what has challenged us uh, in the years and, and changed and challenged? Yeah, and why don't you start? Because you did such a good job <laughs> yesterday. I'm challenged right now. Uh, yeah. um, actually, that's the story of my life is, you know, I, I feel like I've lived this sort of whack-a-mole of, you know, finding all the many things I was raised with that suddenly are called into question and turned upside down and um, having to rethink so many things I was raised with. And not to say that everything I was raised with was, you know, bad or not true or something, but, you know, I felt challenged as I grew and took it on myself to make my faith my own. Um, I could no longer stomach many of the things that I was raised with as a child, and not just, I'm not really referring to my parents as much as the churches I went to and, you know, the atmosphere I grew up in. Um, so I brought this little notebook, it just so happens, it seems like you're a plant in the audience for this. So I, I wrote this thing, I don't know when I wrote it, but I unearthed this little notebook and it says, what is my own history with Jesus? This is like a journal entry. I'm definitely one of those politely raised Christians um, that my teacher, Cynthia Borshow, talks about, in which Jesus is nice and wants us to be nice too. Uh, this, is, this was the essence of my childhood introduction to Jesus. However, I never mixed up Jesus with a strict teacher or behavior policeman. I also gleaned during childhood that Jesus was a teacher. I learned his parables and his confrontational wisdom teachings taken on taking on Pharisees and do-gooders by teaching love and forgiveness over keeping laws and rules to the strictest letter. What was missing in my childhood learning was any kind of path toward non-dual consciousness. In fact, quite the contrary, I was taught hell for the unsaved, rapture and heaven for the saved. Saved meant inviting Jesus into your heart, typically with a public prayer in the context of a group, when you had a documentable event of your salvation. This alone framed Jesus as a kind of dualist, that unless someone prayed that prayer, they were going to hell for eternity. So that became a problem <laughs> really quickly. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll start with that answer, but I could go, go on with all the itemized list of things that I had to put away. Just when you're saying you had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I actually, as Elizabeth knows, um, as many of you know, I had a very similar sort of uh, childhood, and um, 
much of my spiritual life has been about reclaiming the faith that was given to me by my family, particularly by my mom and dad, and shedding a lot of the, uh, the faith that was given to me by the particular churches that we attended when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> my parents turned out to be like closet Episcopalians or something like that um, in a fundamentalist Christian world. Uh, I'll say that there are two things in particular that I've, um, I think two challenges that stand out in my mind. The first is to see God not only in situations with lots of spiritual fireworks, um, situations like the conversion experience around which um, my childhood faith, I think as Elizabeth's was too, uh, was organized. I'll just say that my sister, for example, got saved twice because she was afraid that the first one hadn't taken. She's now an Episcopalian too, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I got saved because I was basically annoyed into it. I kept waiting for God to like, you know, come down on a cloud and like strike lightning bolts into my heart and that kind of thing. And just never happened. And at a certain point, I was just sick and tired of being sick and tired of it not happening. And so I said, okay, I'm saved. I didn't really know if I was or not, but nobody asked me ever again. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, to... Uh, much of my scholarship actually. So I've, I've worked through my pathologies, my spiritual pathologies by becoming a theologian and by spending a lot of time reading people. And one of the things that I discovered was um, were some of these people um, to, whom, uh, to whom Father Peter was alluding a moment ago, particularly John of the Cross, a 16th century Carmelite, um, who says that uh, God is as present when you don't feel God. In fact, God is as present to you when you feel that God is totally absent from you as God is present to you when you feel that God is present to you. That our feelings are actually a very poor barometer of whether or not God is actually with you or not. Um, and incredibly helpful to me because, again, I came from a, a, a faith that uh, thought that God was only in the fireworks and not actually in the daily drudge, as it were, to quote another of my favorite theologians, Karl Rahner. Uh, the, the, second, the second thing that I've really been struggling with has just been in the last year, and it's part of the crucible, being in the crucible of this congregation, or just any congregation, I think. It wouldn't have taken just this one. Uh, you're not particularly difficult or anything like that. It's just living life in the real world rather than living life in the ivory tower. Um, I'll say that I had a theology that was very neat and clean, particularly around God's governance of the world and what theologians call providence. That is uh, God's undergirding relationship to everything that happens. This is the kind of, you know, everything happens for a reason sort of thing. And I, I had a very neat and clean way of understanding that. One that made perfect intellectual sense that I'd inherited from some incredibly smart teachers and by some incredibly smart dead people. Uh, for example, Thomas Aquinas and John Calvin. Uh, and I have to say that um, there was a particular moment last fall when I was visiting one of you in the hospital, and that theology, I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to say anything from that theology to you. It didn't work. It didn't work anymore. I, I could not tell you that this was happening for a reason that I understood. I couldn't. And um, I have been struggling ever since then to figure out what my doctrine of providence is after that. I determined that, uh, you know, it wasn't just that it wasn't workable in the field. It wasn't just that I needed to, like, you know, believe this thing was true, but then, you know, you guys couldn't handle it or something like that. I came to realize that it didn't work in the field because it just wasn't true of God. I am still undecided, actually professionally about what God's relationship to uh, the world and the individual happenings of our lives are about. Mm -hmm. I'm playing with it in sermons, trying to, uh, trying to grasp for it. You're going to hear one more attempt um, at 10 o'clock uh, as I try to move forward here. But I'll tell you, my soul is a whole lot healthier and more at peace now that I've given up that idea, that, that theology that didn't work anymore. I was really conflicted. And now that I'm just happy to let God work in whatever way God works, I am a much better human. Maybe I'm a better priest, but I know I'm a, I'm a, I feel better. Oh. Yeah, how's that, Peter? <clears throat> just don't drop the mic because it sounds terrible. Uh, yeah, so uh, Justin uh, and Elizabeth's experiences are completely foreign to me. Uh, at least with reference to, to upbringing and saved and altar calls and things like that. I didn't grow up in that world. 
Uh, I grew up a, a, a lapsed Roman Catholic, kind of. Uh, and uh, when I came back to the faith after some really incredible uh, um, internal experiences, uh, I, I really uh, went all in, and I, I think I, I felt that uh, I would be a saint. Uh, I felt I'd be a great mystic. I felt that I would be an incredible, I felt I'd be the man. Uh, and I did, I really did. And it was just a matter of time. It really was just a matter of time. And I, I, I pursued an incredible spiritual discipline. Uh, and, uh, and I just really was accomplishing great things. I really was. Uh, I just was waiting for everyone else to notice it. And, uh, and you know, I'm 60 years old, and um, I, I don't believe any of that anymore. I, I think I wasted a tremendous amount of angst, personal angst, uh, trying to achieve a particular life in the spirit. Uh, I'm, I'm essentially a spiritual failure in certain ways. Uh, in that um, I just, I always wanted to write this book called The Fight to Surrender, because I was always trying to surrender, but I was always fighting. Uh, and I think the older I've gotten, the more I've just simply surrendered. And so when I get up in the morning and I don't do my spiritual disciplines, now I just go like, dang, I gotta go, you know, uh, I gotta go. I, I, I mean, there's things I gotta do, I gotta go. And I go, I don't, and I don't sort of beat myself up as much as I used to. And I have found that uh, the more I let go, the better it is. I feel lighter. Uh, I think all people should turn 60, frankly. I, I thought it was going to be, I thought it was going to be terrifying and terrible, but I found out that when I got there, I just, I just cared a lot less. And the less I care, the more uh, I'm, it's a, it's, it works for me. I think it's a little bit like golfing. Uh, I'm a terrible golfer, uh, but I'm a, even a worse golfer when I'm anxious about it and I grip the club too hard. And I think as I've gotten older, I've just gripped the club softer and softer and softer. And I do not know the theological answers to almost anything. The only thing I know is Jesus, and that's good enough for me. Yeah. Would the three of you mind sharing kind of this concept that I have of you of the burden of caring God's love for the world through your eyes and your leadership at, at the church. Elizabeth, why don't you, given what happened in the last week, why don't you say a word about that? Um, let's see. Oh, you, don't want, you want to think. You actually want to think. Um, no. Uh, Let's see. Well, that's a very big question. And I think for me, I, I never feel like the weight of that is on my shoulders, at least not alone. And, and I've always seen my role as a priest, uh, you know, to be present and show up for things, knowing that the community would rally around the situation like it did this week in a humongous way. And yes, there's a moment where you called upon to, you know, say the prayer or be in the right place and um, think of the right next thing to do. Um, but the weight of the love for the world, I think, is upon all of us, you know, and we are kind of aware that that's our role to make space for that and to make opportunity for people to express that and step in. Um, you know, we fill gaps, uh, sometimes haltingly, you know, it's not, it's not a clear thing. And, you know, people say, what was your call to the priesthood? And I think, I'm still waiting for it. You know, I, I, I stepped, I took on this work, um, for some of the reasons Justin went to theology, was to really work out a lot of my bad religion that I had. And, um, and it's happened over time, year by year, uh, experience by experience, and it's, it's in the moments of other people's pain or confusion um, or questions or joys or whatever that, that I, I get a little more sense of, oh, um, this is where it's useful to be doing this work or this is where it's fruitful or, you know, something the world can use, you know. But it's, it's, not, it's not like a special secret formula that, you know, we've got in, in our pockets, you know. So it's, it's something that I think unfolds for us, but we spend our time paying attention to what these questions are and um, 
it's not clear. But you know, we just hope that we're a conduit for the Holy Spirit to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah, what she said. <laughs> um, I'll say that the most um, the most profound moments of my priesthood um, so far, and it's been it's not been all that long. <laughs> it's only I've been ordained for five years um, and a priest for something like four. Um, but the most profound moments in there is whenever that conduit of the Holy Spiritness of priesthood um, is really clear to me because I seem to have nothing to do <laughs> with whatever it is God has done through me. Um, there are moments like um, <laughs> there was one where I got hit on at a bar and I was wearing a clerical collar. Um, and I had no idea what God was doing with that particular situation. <laughs> no clue. But it, it brought home in a particularly, um, in a particularly concentrated way that um, the, a, a life lived uh, not only dressed like this, but uh, you know, uh, in persona, this um, is not about you, but is about whatever it is the other person is going through. Um, I had no idea what God was trying to accomplish there, but you know, pray that God would have done something with that odd situation. I don't know what would drive you to hit on a priest, but anyway. Uh, yeah, poor Jewel, she barely signed up for it, and she knew me before I was one. Um, there are other examples too. I have to say, um, the, the moments when I am really, um, when I, when, the moments when I am unhealthy spiritually are the moments when I try to own the problems and the situations into which we enter to try to be a conduit of the Holy Spirit. When I think that they are mine to solve and not God's. And so I recently went on retreat to Holy Cross Monastery and um, w I spent much of that retreat just enumerating all of the situations and um, issues of the last year to God, one by one by one. And as I did that, as I basically said, Lord, this is your problem, not mine. <laughs> As I did that, one by one by one, it took the, it took, it took basically, it, it took every spare moment of the two days that I was there. But as I did, one by one by one, my soul felt lighter. So, uh, you know, we're all called to live a life in which um, Christ is living through us. It's no longer I, but Christ who lives within me, as St. Paul says in Romans. And priesthood is just a variation on that same thing. And I am best as a human, and I think I'm best as a priest whenever I'm paying attention to that and not trying to take on all of those problems and pretending that they're mine, because they're not actually mine, they're God's. So the difference between being 30 and 60 is I can't enumerate anything. Uh, I, I can't remember it. Uh, I, um, it's an interesting question. I would say that the first thing is nobody should romanticize us uh, in any way. We're not a different ilk, we're just like you. Uh, and, and that's the way that is. I think the second thing is, uh, I, I don't think, um, I mean, I wanted to be a professional athlete. I didn't, or a philosopher, I wasn't smart enough. But uh, the, the, I think the, the issue is, uh, inside the vocation, there is tremendous responsibility. And, uh, but you're given the gift to deal with it, oftentimes. Uh, but I, I do think it's, um, I mean, I'm, I, could, I could turn right around and start bawling right now. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm like that close, not to, to tears, for um, the death of this little boy uh, in, the, in the burial yesterday. Um, and so I, I, I do think there are times when you draw very close to situations that are horrifying. And, um, and it's actually kind of a gift. Uh, and you, you were there, and, and, and I know you've done it with other families. Uh, uh, there is a, there's a sort of spirit that makes it all possible to be with people in their, their deepest grief. Um, and uh, the, I think the issue is not in the moment. I think the issue is later, uh, like when you wake up at nighttime. I mean, I woke up last night again. I was so tired, uh, you know, about the death of this boy. And, and it was, uh, it's almost like nothing to do with it. Uh, I, I will say that the, the congregation, uh, <laughs> you know, these are people that we didn't even know. And now I know. I mean, you, I just say the same thing. I mean, I know these two people so deeply. Uh, it's not a matter of time. You go right to the, you go right to the depths of it. And um, a, a, as we were leaving, as they were leaving yesterday from the reception, uh, the dad said to me, and I don't think I would be sharing things out of, out of, out of inappropriately, that the church uh, had been a, 
uh, an unbelievable, um, uh, I'm gonna use the word gift, that's not the word to use, but uh, a force in, in their family life and, uh, and that, that had really, in some sense, saved them uh, to, to deal with the blow. And, uh, and he didn't even know anybody's name. And I, I said to him, you know, without giving him too much Jesus talk, um, he's new, I'll get, it, get him later. Uh, uh, you know, I just said, you know, uh, uh, we're, we're set up to be a community of love in a broken world. And, um, you know, and, and there are people that get closest to it, but I, the thing that impresses me so much is uh, all of you who volunteered to be ushers and all the, everybody in the altar guild and people who set things up and uh, I, I mean, it, it, the nameless and the faceless, people whose names they may never know gave of themselves. So uh, I, I would say the vocation takes place in communities of love, and, and, and that's good. But, uh, so that was a really long and muddled answer. Um, I, I, do think it's a, uh, I do think it's a great honor uh, to do what we do. We're very lucky people, even though sometimes it's mortifyingly terrible. But, uh, When you, um, you were talking in the beginning about the different stages of um, contemplative life. Yeah. And the fourth one you talked about, a very dark yeah. place. And I don't know if that relates to sort of, you know, experiences of this week or if, if you're talking about sort of something different or if it's kind of woven in. And oh, I yeah. was just wondering if you could just talk a little yeah, bit about that's that. A, yeah, thanks. That's a really good question. So um, the, the, uh, the, the question of the dark night of the soul, what is the dark night of the soul? Dark night of the soul is a, a concept uh, uh, greatly um, uh, uh, fleshed out by St. John of the Cross, uh, who was, uh, this was during the, the, the period where the, the, sort of the science of faith, uh, people were looking at this and trying to understand it. And the phrase grows out of a poem that he wrote called The Dark Night of the Soul. And then he enumerates, or not enumerates, he then explains it. So um, we, at, you know, when I turned 50, uh, I went to a Bruce Springsteen concert with my best friend. And he said, well, what did you learn in 50 years? And I said, I learned that it's all shades of gray. And I also learned that everybody gets knocked down and then you just got to get back up again. And uh, that's what being an adult, that's my definition of an adult. You get knocked down, you just get back up again. And um, in this life of the spirit, there are, there are many different things that don't feel good. Uh, and one of them is the absence, when you, the absence of anything, like our Father art in heaven, help, or whatever you're just, you just, you know, like you're going to meditate, and you just sit there and you think about the grocery store list or something like that. And that's, 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 that's not that. And then there's a thing that is uh, best categorized as spiritual depression. Uh, and spiritual depression is like any depression uh, translated into the life of your spirit. And uh, there are, as you know, there are people who suffer from depression, uh, a diagnosable depression, and that often drips into the life of their spirit, where they, they simply feel down a lot. And in the down, they feel an absence of, they, they feel an absence of warmth, of meaning, of, of anything like that. Uh, the Dark Night of the Soul is a different movement. And uh, whether or not it's brought about by the death of your child, or whether or not it's a movement in the spirit, like, it used to happen to people in monasteries. This is what they were all watching. The old guys, this, these were men writing this. I mean, the women, some great women wrote about this too, but uh, in the case of John, he was watching some of the old guys uh, who had been praying their whole life suddenly go bam, and they would lose it completely. They would go crazy. And, and when they went crazy, they lost, and they felt a complete absence of meaning in all parts of their life, a complete absence of God that they had just wasted the last 42 years getting up seven times, you know, and going to the office seven times. And, and he studied that, that, that. And then for those who were able to ride through it, they, 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 all, they would experience a kind of a burst uh, of life inner life, which, which uh, Teresa of Avila, one of those great women writers, uh, w described as God's presence like a river through your soul. You no longer have to go work at it. It just is there. And, and so I would say, I can't answer the question perfectly, but to say that there is a thing called the dark night of the soul, which happens to people who don't have life awfulness. Um, but they're also in the murkiness of things. There are people that do experience it also. 
in, in deep, deep tragedy. And some people never recover, right? Uh, there are people who, uh, they always say that people who are having trauma come back to church. That's actually not true. Uh, the lion's share of people who bury their child from a church never go back into the church. They literally don't go back into that church. Uh, and, it, and, and, and people feel that God has abandoned them, and so they're not, they're not, they're not coming looking for God who's already abandoned them. They're not interested. So. Much, very, very complicated, lived out in a human life. What is the meaning of life? I got that, but uh, listen, uh, let, let Elizabeth. You want a moment to think again? I mean, uh, <laughs> let Elizabeth handle this one. Uh, no, no, or, or Justin, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I can talk about the dark night of the soul. Uh, yeah. What is the meaning of life? You want to take a whack at this first, Justin? You're a theologian. Um, I think the meaning, okay, so I think that um, human beings are made in the image of a God who is not just loving, but who is love. That is, a God whose very being is self-giving love, a God who gives all of God's self to God's self all of the time. And that human beings, the meaning of our lives, so far as they are, we're supposed to be images of that God, that triune God, that triune God of love, are supposed to be loving and self-giving in the same way. Um, and we see this in, a, in, as, um, in as powerful and clear a form in the life of Jesus of Nazareth, who was God made flesh. God's own self-giving, loving life translated into the human, into a human life, as it were. God's life speaking the language of our lives. So that the meaning of our lives is basically to give ourselves away as Christ gave, our, gave himself away. Um, we are never more fully human than when we are giving ourselves away. That's what I would say. Um, I think that's, that's a beautiful way of saying it. And um, I think there, there, I don't know what the meaning of life is, but there is meaning in all of life, including like the dark night of the soul experiences and those times when you're feeling so befuddled or lost or empty or what have you. I think these are very meaningful times. Um, Thomas Keating is somebody I've read a lot. Uh, he writes a lot, wrote a lot about the dark night of the soul and I would really recommend his books. Um, because he, he frames those times as the very places that are the most fertile, you know, the most creative things happen in these dark times, and we need them in order to clear away the detritus of our lives and, um, and, and in order to really see our path forward and to see the way up, you know, Richard Roy says the way up is the, is the way down. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to hit the bottom before you can really understand how to rise in a new way. And I think our whole series, Fully Alive, is about finding meaning in all these areas of our lives where you know, they seem less important, like money or work or whatever. You know, we're always categorizing our spirituality apart from all these other things. And that was one of the reasons I got really excited about this approach to our, our season is that um, you know, it's so easy for people to put spirituality on Sunday and not understand how it infuses the rest of the week and the rest of our lives. And, um, you know, I get so much out of a great movie or a great art exhibition or a great dinner with people I love and, or something like that. It's just sometimes I get the most meaty kind of meaning out of those, those times. Or, you know, so I feel like the, the meaning of life is in our attention and where we put our attention and how we engage uh, with the world around us. The meaning is in the intention we bring to that and what, what kind of people we want to be. You know, we, we, we make meaning with our lives, otherwise they could be very meaningless, you know. Yeah. That's beautiful. So I, I, I would just say the meaning of life as far as I, is love. And uh, I, I've, you know, I've been a priest for 26 years and I have heard countless eulogies and there's only one thing that anybody cares about is love. They don't care if you're the senior vice president. Uh, uh, they only care if you loved. That, that's the only thing that has any meaning, I believe. 
Uh, and, and from our perspective, my perspective, I would say if I had to, so I would say the meaning of life is love. If I had to produce one other word, I'd say Jesus is the meaning of life. Uh, and if you follow the path of Jesus, you're leading the meaning of life. I, I just, I'm, I'm absolutely like crazy clear about that, that it's all about love. And so that's give your, give your life away, and you can find love anywhere. It's, it's everywhere. Right? That, that's it. That's it. There's no, it's not complicated. Man, it ain't complicated. I think of my Christian faith and my Christian life as it's paradoxical. It is really easy. I mean, the meaning of life is love. Black and white. That's, that's simple. And then the question comes, okay, how do I do that? Because it's really hard <laughs> with this person or with that person or with this situation or that situation. So God is love, and that's really easy, and it's wonderful. And then on the other hand, God is this incredibly huge complicated thing that doesn't fit in my head so uh, oh yeah that's I, I, I agree i agree so the applying I, i'll go first and you guys can correct me uh uh I, when, I, when he asked the question i went right to find the lyrics to all you need to love um So, um, you know, that's, that's back to that comment I made about ambiguity and gray, you know, that there's no, nothing is clear cut in our lives. I mean, I don't know. I, I'll just tell you, um, I don't know anybody who's all good. You know, when they say all good, I don't know anybody who's all good. I don't know. I know a lot of people that are actually quite bad. Uh, they, they feel pretty cruddy. Uh, and, but I, so the application, but I think that Jesus is a problem. So for instance, we were in the Holy Land and we were, we had an event, there was a thing we were coming out of, uh, 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 the place called the primacy of Peter, where Peter, uh, uh, uh was in the war, I mean, where Jesus met Peter for, uh, in the resurrection scene and we were walking out and there was a kind of thing that happened walking up the, the pathway I'm going to lose clarity here so that I don't give away what happened, but um, it was very clear in my mind. But somebody said something, and it galled me. I mean, I was, and the amount of answers I had to respond, I had some great responses. I mean, these things were killers. They were intended to kill. My answers were intended to kill, and they were really good. And I looked around, and I thought, I, these are so good, i got to say them. And then I didn't, and I kept walking. And I was walking out, I got in the bus, and I'm like, man, I cannot stand Jesus. I just literally don't like the guy. Because it's the only reason I did. I decided I, I didn't care about anyone else. I, I was willing to throw them. I was willing to throw myself under the bus, so to speak. But for Jesus, I held my tongue. And it still makes me crazy. So I'm, a, I'm in agreement with you. We live in an unbelievably ambiguous world. And, uh, I mean, just go to play, go to a, apply Jesus to our national policies, okay? And, but I mean, I don't mean like the Jesus that is being talked about in Washington, okay? I mean, apply the real Jesus to our national policies, and you want to talk about, ooh, hard. But anyway, sorry, I took my long way this here. Mm -hmm. Hussein? Thank you. So, uh, Father Peter, you said that you three are the same as the rest of us. But what I, you know, one of I think the first question was about <clears throat> Elizabeth said that she wanted she needed to rethink what she was raised with. <clears throat> Justin said similar uh, things. I, I, my sense is that you all you all reached a point at some stage in your life where you changed direction, and that's the difference <clears throat> that I see. Or one of the differences. So what was it, what is it that made you change direction, what, the three of you? What is it that not only made you change direction, but sustain that direction? I think that for me, they've been these moments where um, whatever I believed has become unlivable. Um, I, so in the, the, in, the, um, in the Christianity that I grew up with, um, I was incredibly worried about my friends going to hell, my friends who were atheists or agnostics or, um, or my friends who had recently come out as gay. Um, those were 
in particular, I could, I could name you their names, but I'm not going to because we're being recorded. Um, I was worried about particular people being condemned by God to spend a day um, an eternity in um, being eternally punished for their rejection of God. And um, I had been given as a youth in this particular Christian culture a, um, a incredibly powerful mandate. I've been told to go save the world. You know, save the world for Jesus. Go and save these people from going to hell. And um, mm. I thought nobody else had convinced them, but I was gonna, because I am an intellectual stud. <laughs> and I can convince them. I can convince them that this whole thing is true. I can convince them that God is real. I can convince them that Christianity is the most rational way to believe about God and so on and so forth. And um, guess what? It didn't work. It didn't work. And when it didn't work, I couldn't, I just couldn't live that way any longer. I was 17, and I had one of those arguments with my parents that, you know, you have an argument with your parents that it's not really about the thing you were arguring about. I had broken curfew, and I, had, I, had, I was mad at my parents, and they were mad at me, and we, we had this argument, and I ran back to my room, and I, I, I cried myself to sleep. But I wasn't actually arguing with my parents. I was taking out my anger with God that God would set up the world in such a way that my friends would fail at it and then end up in this merciless place. And um, I felt that, um, so I've not, had a, I've not had a lot of you know, powerful um, sorts of like spiritual fireworks, as I said, but God's given me just enough, to, um, <laughs> just enough to be me and just enough to get by. Um, I felt that I, you know, those moments where your internal monologue seems to come from somewhere you don't expect it to, that happened to me. It wasn't as though I heard an audible voice. It was just that I, something occurred to me that hadn't occurred to me before, and it seemed to be spoken to me. Uh, it, was, it was not in my, it wasn't in my voice. I'm not saying it came from outside, but it was not like, uh, you know, it, the I of the statement was not me. That seemed to be clear. And it said, um, Justin doesn't save people, Jesus saves people. And from that moment, I was fine. Wow, beautiful. <clears throat> well, I, I guess I would um, want to preface anything I say with that, you know, I look back, it's taken me a long time to get to this, to this point, but I look back on my life and my childhood, um, and I spent three decades, I would say, really angry about my religion, my family's religion. And I mean, just so angry that it, it colored everything. And I, it drove me to seminary, you know? I mean, I, I really had to figure it out. And I, I was preoccupied. I was a, a journalist in magazines, and I, was, I had a great, glamorous job. I worked for Travel and Leisure, and I was all over the world. And, um, but I, I couldn't get past this, these questions about God and how all these different ways of being Christian could all be called the same thing and claim the same person as their guide and be so at, at odds. Um, and I'm talking about my Episcopal childhood, which was beautiful, and um, this other path my parents took us on, which in our particular place at that time was wild and crazy and traumatizing. Um, but the, it didn't make sense that these were bedfellows or could even be smiled upon by the same Jesus, you know. But at the same time, good came out of all that, and I learned things. I mean, each thing was kind of a step towards, you know, building my own sense of worth with God and all those things. And I, I can't look back and spit on any of those places where I was in the shadows or where I was misled or hurt or whatever. I feel like uh, they've all opened me up in a way to other people's experiences and, uh, you know, you look back on the steps you took to get where you are. Without them, you wouldn't have gotten there, you know? So you can't really just reject it all and say, now I have the answers. And I feel like the things that I let go of um, have been instructive. I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to put this into words, but um, they're, they're all, it's not about arriving in a place where finally you're right and that was wrong. It's more about growth and about um, just realizing you don't, I never have a corner on all my answers and that I, all my blind spots are now revealed and you know, there's always something to, to rethink. So I feel like Jesus for me was a teacher. He, he was everything, but you know, primarily on earth, he was a teacher. He was always called rabbi. Everything that came out of his mouth was an instructive 
opportunity. He talked about Caesar's coins and you know, he, everything was a parable or a question or you know, an invitation to rethink something. And I feel like that's my relationship to Jesus now is like, if I'm so sure of something, there's probably another way to look at it still. And not to say I never have solid ground, but you know, there's always a way to like get behind a thing and think of it more wisely or more usefully. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of glad that I've had all this breadth of exposure to strange religion because it's, you know, it's other people see it that their way, and you can have conversations about it. But um, it's not about right and wrong for me. It's sort of like how is all this included? Because somehow it's all included in the bigger picture, and somehow God has a way of showing up through any kind of strange circumstance. And so I want to keep open to that. That's what sustains uh, yeah. me, turning things around. Uh, just, just say, uh, I, I, I did have a sort of road to Damascus experience. Uh, I was uh, really, really lost, and I, had, I, would, I hated my 20s. And uh, I didn't like working in an investment bank, didn't want to work in an advertising agency. I was looking for the meaning of life. So I decided to go on a search for God because if God existed, God has something to do with the meaning of life. And so I, I, I plunged into non-Christian literature about God uh, and really, really went on a search. And then finally, uh, I, I sort of surrendered to like, okay, I'll take a look at the Bible. Uh, and I was living in Freddie's basement, and there was a Gideon Bible that was taken from a hotel room. And I got a hold of the Gideon Bible, and I lived down in his basement in 23 Locust Lane, his little house about the size of his mat. And um, no offense, Fred. Uh, he's in the he's in the back. He, he said I just said that the house, that's bigger than the house was. Anyway, uh, I'm joking. The um, but the Bible had the old had the New Testament, and the Psalms, and the Proverbs, and I knew that the Psalms were prayers, but that didn't assume that God. I was not interested in Jesus, so I did away the, with the New Testament, and uh, and then so I said, okay, Proverbs, Proverbs is it, and I I was. Uh, I got in bed the first night, and I opened it up, and I was like, oh, these are good, man. I kind of like this stuff. Uh, and so on the second night, I got into bed, and I pulled the book off the shelf, and I opened it up, Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not unto your own understanding. And I nearly, literally levitated out of the bed. Uh, and I stood in the middle of this, down this basement bedroom where I lived in my, you know, my T-shirt, uh, and I felt God's presence in the room uh, in, an, in, a, in a life-changing, overwhelming way. Uh, and I, I, you know, I'd had a lot of fun at certain points, points of my childhood, but I had never experienced joy like I experienced it there. Uh, and the presence came in. It was like being a fish. I was inside of me and now all around me. Uh, and I, um, I knew in that moment that I was okay. I was unclear if I was okay. I knew in that moment. Um, that, oh no, I knew in that moment that God existed, uh, and I knew that I was okay. And I knew I. Was, to serve God the rest of my life. And now I was a lapsed Roman Catholic kid who felt called to be a priest. So it was complicated from there. And then I couldn't stand the joy, so I, wait to hear this, I did jumping jacks. Okay, when's the last time you did jumping jacks? Anyway, we need to wrap it up. This is, we're already on the long side. So but, uh, the liturgy will begin on time because that's the type of people we are. Uh, thanks for coming. Next week, Justin's gonna answer everything that we didn't answer today. Thanks. <laughs>